to another episode of Pimp Your Brilliance with Monique Malcolm, a podcast about brilliant people leveraging their passions to create their own opportunities. I aim to show you what's really possible when you shut down the course of fear and lean into your genius zone. You can learn more about this show and subscribe for updates by visiting keepchasingthestars.com backslash podcast or come hang out with me on Instagram at Star Chasers Only. Are you ready? Let's do this. Hey, Star Chasers, it's Monique. Before I introduce today's guest, I want to ask for a really quick favor. If you like the show, you're enjoying the show, please, please, please rate it on iTunes. So go and leave a review. All of the reviews help with rankings in the the podcast store, and that helps me grow the show, that helps me book better guests, and it helps me have a better positioning in the podcast store for iTunes. So if you are using an iPhone or a iPad, go to the podcast app, search for Pimp Your Brilliance, and once you find it, you'll see an option to leave a review, click it, log into your iTunes account, leave a review, and you will be my favorite ever. Now, let's talk about today's show. Today, I'm interviewing Twinkie Chan. And if you don't know who Twinkie Chan is, she's this amazing crochet designer. Twinkie Chan designs and crochets food-themed accessories like cupcake scarves, hamburger mitts, hot dog purses, all at her website, TwinkieChan.com. She lives in San Francisco with her two pups and her infamous rainbow wall of yarn. And guys, you have to go to her website and check out her rainbow wall of yarn. It is amazing. Her unique work has been featured online in print, on television. She's been in the online craft game for years. She has lots of great crochet tutorials and films on her YouTube channel. It's perfect for a DIY handmade craft lover. So if that is you, today is your lucky day because today's guest is all about the craft life. And she offers so much insight and so many gems into how she's been running her business, how she's monetized her business, how she promotes her business, and I think you should just give it a listen. Get your pen and paper, take some notes, and here we go. Hey, Twinkie Chan, welcome to the show. Hi, thanks for having me. I'm so excited to have you. Many people don't know, one of my first attempts at doing a business online was Etsy. And I think that's where I saw your brand, and I've followed your brands for years. So I'm so excited to have you on the show because it's like this is, comes full circle. Well, I appreciate it. I appreciate the support also. I love to start out with people giving a bit of their background. Like, how did you get started? How did you get into crafting? Right. So I'm a crochet designer. And my best friend's grandma taught us both how to crochet, maybe when we were 10 years old. So it's kind of a skill or craft that has always sort of been in the background of my life. Like if I needed a unique gift for someone, I'd be like, oh, I can crochet them something. But it was not something that I did every day or had any plans of doing as a job. It was just definitely like a, a hobby, a side thing. Um, I actually was in book publishing for 10 years as an agent. So I was helping writers sell their books to publishers. Um, and there was a moment in time where I moved to the city of San Francisco proper and I lived in an especially foggy neighborhood. So, and I know that people who actually live in cold climates don't think San Francisco is cold, but it was cold to me. (laughs) So I was starting to make scarves for myself and, um, I really wanted scarves that I couldn't find in the store that were super unique. Uh, And I kind of was looking around online and people were already making animal themed scarves and like cute cats or bunny scarves. So I've kind of always had an affinity for toy food, like faux food, like plastic toy food. And so I kind of combined that love with my love for crocheting. And so I started making food themed scarves for myself. So it would have like a toast scarf or like a salad scarf. And I just got so in love with the idea and the feeling of making things. I just had like 12 scarves stacked up in my closet that I wasn't wearing. So this was like in 2005 where like everyone was starting to build their own vanity websites for whatever purpose. But like having your own website was kind of a thing. Like it was starting to be a new thing. So I was like, oh, I want to have my own website. And so I decided to, like, I made my boyfriend at the time build my website. (laughs) Like he drew it and he made it work and everything. And so we put those 12 scarves up on the website and they sold within a week. And I was like, I, it was kind of a joke, you know, for myself. I was like, oh, this is just sort of a vanity project for myself. But um, it was kind of the first time I got this indication that people actually liked what I was making. And that was cool. 
And I was still working at my publishing job at the time. Um, and the, the structure of how things worked at my job were kind of changing. And I think the, the temperature of the publishing industry was changing. And I was at this moment where I felt like I was splitting my passion between two things and I was kind of failing at both of them. Like I really kind of wanted to explore where the crafting and crocheting was going. And I had this guy who was asking me if I was into like mass production and licensing. And I'm like, could this be a thing? Like, could this actually be a thing? And so I just kind of took that leap. You know, I I had this, I, I had this feeling that there could be someone out there who might take my designs and run with them. And if someone was going to do that, it might as well be me. So I left my job in 2009 and now I'm here. (laughs) I love that. And that's what you just said about, you know, someone can take your designs and run it. My school with you. I love that you had that aha moment and you just decided to go ahead and go for it because it's, I mean, that could happen and it it does happen in the craft world. So I'm glad that you just kind of were like, okay, I'm going to see if I can make this work. And here you are, because I mean, at this point, you've been doing this for, is it, are we past two, 10 years? Uh, not quite. Maybe like, well, I mean, as a full-time thing, maybe seven years. Yeah. But I first launched my website in 2005. So I've sort of been out there for 12-ish years. That's ancient yeah. in the internet time. If you just think about yeah. like all of the things <laughs> that have happened in the past 10 years, because uh, 10 years ago, I mean... Did we, Facebook was not what it is today. I mean, MySpace was still a thing. Yeah, it was definitely MySpace. MySpace and eBay were yes. hot. <laughs> yeah. So I think I love that. Yeah. So crocheting, you, you know, you you learned how to crochet by a friend, grandmother, and you've been doing this. At this point, I mean, people typically see crocheting in knitting kind of like as old lady crafts. Do you feel like the work that you have put out in some of the books and things that you have created have uh, generated interest in the younger generation when it comes to crafting in that way? Oh, for sure. Um, I mean, I do think that, I mean, I think knitting can kind of seem more fashiony, but crochet apparel definitely has sort of an old fashioned retro granny look. Um, it can be difficult to make crochet look beautiful. Uh, so I think I opted to make it look cute. And so, yeah, that definitely draws a younger demographic I get a lot of emails you know from eighth graders how old would that be like 12 or 13 year olds girls and boys who are like oh when's your next YouTube tutorial going up or I love your work or like send me free stuff and whatever their email is it's super cute because they always get like I'm 10 I'm 12 so I'm definitely aware that it draws younger crowd some teachers get in touch with me and say oh I use your book you know to teach my young crafters so uh, that's really cool it's to inspire creativity in, you know, a younger generation and not only creativity, but, you know, an entrepreneurial interest, too, because they want to start like, you know, I'm selling at my, you know, booth at my whatever charity school function. And that's really awesome. That's a really great feeling. You just you mentioned something that is a good segue. Uh, so talk to me about YouTube. because I know that you have used YouTube for a while. Um, and you, you use it a lot to promote your brand and promote your blog. So can you talk to me about that? So I'm a reluctant YouTuber. <laughs> I never really wanted to do it. Um, like I'm pretty, I'm, a, I'm fairly introverted and shy. Um, a long, long time ago, maybe back in 2006 or seven, I'm not sure when, there was a show on HGTV called Uncommon Threads. And they were like, we want to fly you in and we want to put you on TV to talk about your work. And everyone wants to kill me for it. But I said, no, <laughs> I was like, I don't want to see myself on TV. I was like, I will send my product if you want to do it, just a segment with the host showing the product. But I don't myself want to be on the TV. Like I just, I couldn't bear it at that moment in time. Um, so as far as YouTube, yeah, I never had this big idea that I wanted to be like the next, you know, famous YouTuber or whatever. That's never been my goal. Um, however, when I started sharing my patterns, which I also thought I would never do when I first started, you know, selling my designs, uh, you know, people would say, I'm a really visual learner and I don't know how to read patterns. And I'm kind of old fashioned. I was like, well, you should (laughs) know how to read patterns. 
and I'm not going to create video content for you just because you don't want to put in the effort. But I do know that everyone learns in a different way. And I think with my YouTube channel, I was hoping to also encourage people to learn how um, when I film my or when I edit my crochet videos, I also run the written pattern underneath. So I'm hoping at least in some way it familiarizes people with what the abbreviations look like and, you know, what a line in a pattern might look like and how that translates into what I'm doing on the video. So um, I really like it for me. It's, I think it's definitely opened my work up to a different audience. Uh, there's There are a lot of people who just use YouTube as their television. Like I'm not one of those people. So it was kind of odd to me, but like there are people who are just all up on YouTube all the time and that's their main resource for like entertainment or education so I really like the feeling of creating that community there. Um, like I think it's important for us to be active and interactive with our audience on whatever social media we're on. And so I really love that little community that I've created on YouTube. And, you know, people will help each other if there are questions. And so it kind of helps both of us. I mean, it is a good way to promote my brand. It's a way for me to help my customers. Um, I can use it to post like, you know, a, a commercial for my new book, or even if I'm offering a free tutorial with the video, um, I can talk about and link to other, you know, patterns or items I have for sale in my Etsy shop. So um, I've really learned to like it, even though at first I didn't want to do it at all. <laughs> so with your, so you're a reluctant YouTuber, is there a, a, yeah. <laughs> a social media platform that you prefer that you get a lot of engagement with? I think for me right now, it's Instagram. And I feel like, I think I break some of the rules on Instagram. Like I, I know I, a lot of popular Instagram accounts will be highly curated with very high quality photos and they're beautiful and people want to follow them because they're, you know, inspirational. I've always just treated my Instagram like the garbage dump of my mind. So it's not always gorgeous. It's not always high quality, but I feel it's like really me. It's really authentic. And I think people like that as well. And I just love using it to find other creative people, other like-minded people. So I just naturally gravitate toward it because I just like it on a personal level. That's so funny to me that you say that because, you know, your products are super cute and they're colorful and your craft room yeah. with your wonderful, colorful yarn wall. I mean, like they're made for Instagramming. So um, True. <laughs> it's it's funny that you take that approach, but it works because I think last time I checked, you had like over 40,000 followers on Instagram. So, you know, maybe that's a sign that people don't care. They like being able to see the unfiltered version of you. Yeah, it's not bad. I mean, Instagram is changing also. You know, now you have the Instagram stories where that's a place where I think now people put their more casual, their less curated photos and video and I've thought about it, but just as a user, I'm not looking at that those IG stories as much. So I think as like a content creator, I'm I'm like less inclined to use it myself, which is probably bad. I'm like I I don't really strategize on social media. I just kind of do whatever I want. So yeah. Well, I like that because it's working. And I mean, after all this time, you you've made this be sustainable. So obviously, some of this kind of throwing crossing to the wind and, and screwing the rules, it works, or at least it works for you. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't think people should be super uptight about it. I mean, I'm all for beautiful content. And, you know, when I'm shooting uh, photos of my work, I definitely try to use, like, you know, the big camera, not my phone, and light it well. But I think as far as just interacting with uh, my audience, you know, I like showing a goofy photo of what I'm doing or I like showing like the ugly things that I baked. Like, I don't know, that's funny to me and maybe it'll be funny to somebody else too. <laughs> so talk to me about um, how you've been able to monetize your brand because I know you've, you've done Etsy, you've done craft shows, but at this point, I mean, you kind of dabbled or done a, a couple of different things. So I'd love to talk about that. Yeah, I feel like um, I'm actually always at the point where I kind of do a little bit of everything and see what sticks, you know, like I'm always open to trying new things. So I do have my Etsy shop and um, I sell, you know, my finished crochet work there. I also sell patterns, which I'm actually trying to do more of this year. I'm trying to buckle down and really just crank out some old patterns that I have and prepare them so that they're like in this sellable 
quality, like with the photos um, and just the written pattern. So I'm hopefully going to build that up because I think it's important for us to develop uh, avenues of passive income as creative people, because whatever we create can take a long time to make. And for me, you know, even if I sell something on Etsy for like $60, like if I actually did the math, I should probably be selling it for more. But I also know that no one's going to pay for it if it's like $8 million. So there are kind of, um, you know, some numbers that you have to tweak. So I think for me, especially as a crocheter, finding avenues of passive income are important. Um, I also teach at creativebug.com. And I, that's not a regular gig, but um, it's definitely another way to make money. Like if you can shoot video content for other companies. Um, and I've been approached by other companies as well, but I, it's, I just haven't taken the time to really explore it. I mean, there are all sorts of websites like that, like Brit & Co. or Creative Live. There is another one I can't remember right now, but there are opportunities out there for you to make money with your videos also, aside from YouTube. Um, I also do YouTube. I should also dedicate more time to that. I'm like the worst YouTuber. I maybe post content once a month, but sometimes I don't post for eight months, which is terrible. Like that's the worst. Like no one's doing that. Um, but you know, I do all the filming and all the editing. So it just takes like editing video takes forever. And my videos are like an hour long, which I know is also like something people do not do on YouTube. Like people's YouTube videos are like three to five minutes long. Uh, but I like the idea of being like one of the few people who will show a project from beginning to end. So whether or not people are watching the whole thing is a different story, but I just sort of like having that content out there. So you, I will never be like a famous YouTuber because no one's going to sit there and watch an hour long crochet video unless they're like super into crochet. But I accept that. And um, it's just part of my branding. It's just part of what I want to do. So there's all that video content that you can monetize your work through. Um, I also have two crochet books and that's a nice punch of money. Like for the first two years of the book's life, it, unless it's a super bestseller, you're probably not going to live off your book earnings. So you should always be trying to work on your next book or just, you just use that as like also a part of your branding or books seem to be sort of like a legitimizing engine for crafters. Like, yeah, I'm legit. I have two books. So I don't know. You can, do deal with that as you wish. The other ways I do speak at conferences from time to time. Um, and also the craft fairs are really great because that's like, you know, um, a big surge of money kind of all in one weekend. Um, I could do more than I do because they're all over the country now. Like Renegade Craft Fair has like even, you know, overseas, like they're in the UK also. Uh, of course, a reality is that you have to pay for your travel. So your whatever you make at your booth might not cover your travel, but sometimes it can barely cover it, but it's just a good excuse. Like it's a good like business expense. And then you can just use that as an excuse for a vacation, you know? So, um, you can work that however you want, but, um, so yeah, I think as far as I can think, those are the main ways that I monetize just kind of all over the place, you know, always kind of thinking of the next new thing. Like, do I want to do a subscription box? Do I, you know, there are just things that I'm always thinking about doing next. So I, I don't know if you do it anymore, but I know um, back in the day, you used to do these really intricate booth setups for your craft shows. Have you kind of yeah. let that go or do you bring it out no. for special occasions? <laughs> um, I can't let it go. Like, the last time I did Renegade, I did like, I don't know if everyone knows what a bento box is, but it's like a Japanese lunch box and they're really beautiful or really cute. And they, and, um, in Japan, they'll turn like a rice ball into a cartoon character or they'll turn a hamburger into a bear with like a bear face. So they're very cute. It's, it's really artful to me. And I think it's fascinating that somebody's putting all this effort into this food art and then it's just eaten. <laughs> so I liked the idea of celebrating this kind of food art with my crochet because it has more of a permanence. So I was thinking of how to set up this booth. Um, and so I wanted to do kind of like a deli or a buffet setting. So I don't know if you saw it, but, um, I like we created like a sneeze guard and we had these like little sectioned off boxes where all the different pieces of food were and people could build 
their own lunchbox with various fruits and vegetables and everything had a face and everything was really cute. So we like, we kind of put a lot of effort, like my best friend helped me and we put a lot of effort into this setup, but I'm going to do Renegade again in July here in San Francisco and I'm going to do something completely different themed. So I have to create a completely different setup, but to me that it's so fun and yes, it's an expense, but when people walk by, you know, they're like, wow, this is great. This really stands out. And in a sea of like hundreds of booths, like you got to stand out, you got to make people stop. So for me, it's worth it and it's fun. So it's, I think it's really important to put some thought into your booth display and make it different. <laughs> That's a part of the Twinkie Chan experience. I mean, I, I know that you're very intentional with your brand, but everything is so consistent. I'm like, when I go to your website or I've been to your Etsy shop, or I've just seen you pop up online. I mean, it's very, very consistent. In addition to the fact that you just stand out because you have your pink hair and your, your yeah. tattoo sleeve. I mean, it's, uh, your, your branding is spot on. It's a definitely a direct reflection of yourself. Do you, um, yes. do you still uh, shoot your own photography for your products? I know you used to like um, put yourself into a lot of the product photography. Yeah, I still do because it's easy. <laughs> like I'm here. Um, I'm always accessible to myself. So if there's a product that I have to put on a person, yeah, it will generally be me. And when I had my licensed brand, Yummy You, I was kind of like, I'm a little tired of my own face. Do you think it'll harm the branding to use other models? And my, my business partner was like, no, 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 let's try using different models this time. So yeah, I would just shoot pictures of my friends at that point. And um that, you know, it takes some organization. You got to get people over to your house and make time for people's schedules. So I generally just default to myself. I don't have to pay anyone. And if I want to shoot at midnight, I can. So it's a, it's a, it's a lot of flexibility for me. <laughs> I bet. But again, it makes your brand stand out and it makes your, your just the experience of, of being exposed to your brand very, very consistent. So with your branding, I know, you know, in the beginning, things kind of develop over time, but you kind of yeah. stayed along the same path. Is that intentional? Like, do you just kind of like how it's been all this time? Do you think that you'll change it? Because I know a lot of people who are creative, myself um, included, I always want to change mm -hmm. my website. I always want to redo things. But then you have to realize, like, customers get used to or clients get used to certain things. So you have to be, it's like a delicate balance. But do you get tired of that or do you just kind of just like how it is and you just roll with it? Um, no, I think we definitely can get tired of our own branding. <laughs> like, and I've heard from people that it's actually good to revamp your website now and again and just sort of refresh and update. And, you know, I've never followed a trend really. And I, I don't really know like what's trendy in like web website layout these days. Uh, so I can't really speak to that, but I'll, I'll follow other blogs who change up their look from time to time. And, you know, it can be like cleaner or more modern looking, you know, as it evolves, but it still feels like that person's brand. Like it's, it's enough of a subtle change where you don't feel like, Oh, what's happened? Like did, did another person take over? And for me, you know, every van from time to time, you know, like my first website was, um, like a hand drawn refrigerator and then, which was static. And I think the next incarnation of my, of my website, I, I drew the refrigerator, uh, like in Photoshop and Illustrator and everything was animated. So to me, it kind of looked like Pee Wee's Playhouse, like the butter was jumping up and down. And, um, I don't know, like there was a, there was an egg carton that I think was opening and closing. So it was a very kind of, uh, dynamic look. But that was also very limiting. Like, it was difficult to add new links to that. Like, when my book came out, I'm like, uh, do I have to create a new jumping food for the book? So at that point, I was like, we need to simplify. So now my website looks like how it does now, and there isn't the refrigerator. But it's still, like, kind of cute and pink and sprinkly. And there are ways to, uh, to like, refresh your look that I think can still be on brand for you. You know, I like I redo my business card all the time. Like, I don't think anyone cares. Like, I don't know. It's still kind of rainbowy and cute. You know, but uh, and it's colorful, but I I did feel like I needed to streamline a little bit and not look so kind of cluttery. Uh, so I think that's okay. But I I think the funny comment that I get sometimes when people meet me is that they're like, "Oh, you're just like your brand," you know, like with like the pink hair and the colorful clothes. And 
for me, it, it, that's an astonishing comment because I just think of like, well, my brand is actually a reflection of me. Like it's a very authentic extension of me. I'm not trying to like live in my brand. I don't know if I'm like explaining that in a way, but to me, it's like sort of an opposite thing where they kind of see me as trying to adapt to my brand. Whereas my brand is just me. It's, that's just myself. And I think that's an easy way to keep it authentic and to give it longevity because it's not false. Like it, I wasn't like trying to follow a trend that I didn't really feel connected to in like an organic way. Like everything I do is just stuff that I want to do. So I think it's important to keep that in mind too. Like, ha- like follow your passion. Like don't be too uh, swayed by what's trending. Like just do what you want to do. Do what you really like. Do what you really love. Now, if I met you and you didn't look like your brand, I think I would be disappointed <laughs> because I assume that uh, what I see online is what I would see in person. So that is kind of right. funny that people don't automatically connect that and think that's what they're going to get. And I, I tell people all the time, like, you know, don't be something online that you're not because it's disappointing yeah. when people meet you. And <laughs> it's like, you know, if people saw me and I was like really you know, suited up or, or pants suit and like kitten heels mm. and like the whole thing. I, I think people would think that was strange because, you know, yeah. my website, I have big hair and it's colorful. Yep. So I think that's, it's awkward yeah. and people don't want that. So you have to really be who you are all the time. So yes, at this point, you've been online for years. You've done so many different things. You've written books, you've licensed stuff, you've pr- done craft shows, you speak, you teach. What do you feel have been your keys to success? Keys to success. Hmm. That's a tough question. I mean, I think it, it all smushes together. Um, I don't think there's any one specific social media or one specific avenue that brought success more than any other. I just feel like, I just feel like, being authentic is really important, like being authentic to yourself and your own creativity. And I also think what's really important, especially in the world of social media, is to interact. Like it's a two-way street. I know a lot of people back in the day wanted to be the next famous blogger. And, um, oh, I forgot to talk about that with the, like, um, income streams, because you can do advertising on your blog, but whatever, that's... (laughs) That question was like a million questions ago, (laughs) but so, so to be the next famous blogger. And, um, I think that people will post up their blogs or even like post up a YouTube video and they'll be surprised that they don't get followers or they don't get views. And like, I have a friend who tried to start up a YouTube channel and she's like, it's hard. Like, how do you get views? And I'm like, well, it's a two way street. You can't just throw up the content and expect everyone to come to it. You know, like you have to post it in your other social media. On YouTube, you should be commenting on other YouTube videos that kind of might speak to the same audience as yours. Like you need to keep increasing your footprint in all those different social media places um, because you never know who's reading that comment that you're leaving someplace else and they'll follow you back to your channel or your social media account. And it has to be this sense of community, unless you're like really lucky and really famous. And in that case, I don't know, that's an entirely different model. But if you're just starting out, no one knows who you are. You're just trying to build that audience. You know, you really need to put in that work, whether you're hiring someone to do it or whether you're doing it yourself um, to really interact with your community and reach outside of the own your own universe that you're creating for your brand and interact with other people's brands, too. And for me, that became, that came naturally because I'll fangirl over someone else's brand. Like when I first started out, I loved Heidi Kinney from my paper crane. Like she was my hero. She made these really cute food plush dolls. I'm like, who is this girl? She's my hero. She's doing this crafting thing. She really inspired me to try doing my own crafting thing. And so like I would follow her blog and comment her blog. And I finally met her at a craft show in LA and we're friends now. So you, it's really like you need to start creating your own posse. <laughs> like you need to be like kind of active about that. And I know back in the day when I would say this to people, they would say, oh, I don't really like social media and this whole thing. And I'm like, well, get used to it because this is a thing. And if you don't, you know, start incorporating this into your business plan, like you're losing out on so much opportunity. So, yeah, just making sure that you're interacting with your customers, 
and you know, outreaching to we're reaching out to other bloggers and makers too, and that's so important. So you have to keep that in mind. Like, if you're feeling like you're an island, like there's a reason why. <laughs> like you need to start building that community, like you know, with your own two hands. All right. So same question, kind of flipped on its head. What do you feel have been your biggest challenges? My biggest challenges. Okay, for me, it's on a very basic level. Like my work is pretty niche. It's not going to be for everyone. So I think that's a challenge on its own. Um, like not everyone wants to wear a hamburger scarf. You know, not everyone's going to wear a purse that looks like a slushy. Um, so in a way, I think that was a blessing and a curse because it's great for branding. If someone wants a weird, funky food themed thing, they know to look in my shop. If someone wants, you know, like a poncho they can wear every day to work, probably not my shop. And that's probably the majority of people shopping. <laughs> you know what I mean? So on that level for me, um, I always feel like there might be a limit to how much I can scale my business because it's not for everybody and it's not meant to be for everybody. And I think another major challenge is people kind of have to be taught what handmade items cost, you know? Like, I'll be at a craft show, and I already discount my scarves at craft shows. Like, I try to keep everything under $100, and people will still be like, oh, this is really expensive. And they're not shy. Like, they'll tell you to your face, like, why is this so expensive? And, you know, if you you can't run down, like, this, like, math formula with everyone who asks that. But, again, there is this education, I think, that happens where people need to be taught, you know. Like, this took, like, 10 hours to make. You know, if I paid myself like minimum wage, you know, I, there's already there, the cost would be ext- like astronomical if I actually sold these items for what I should. Like if I were like, you know, a big business and I had my bottom line and I was actually doing the numbers. And so um, I think that can be a barrier, too, for crocheters and knitters because our work takes so long. Plus, there are hobby crocheters and knitters who don't really need to or need to or want to make money from this. They just do it for fun and they basically want you know, um, just to make back the cost of materials. So we're competing with them too on Etsy where something I might sell for a hundred, someone is selling for like $25 and I'm like, what are you doing? So I think those are like the two main barriers, you know, like for just for me personally, like I know that I have really niche work and also just that, you know, that speed bump of the pricing of crocheting and knitting, uh, that's, that's something you kind of have to work around in your own way also. Yes, and that's that's a, a very good point. And it, it happens, I think, across in, oh, several industries online, not just handmade, but that's a huge issue in the handmade community. Um, I used to sell T-shirts at craft shows when I got that was my main business for a number of years. I, I had a T-shirt line, and you go to craft shows, and you're right. Uh, the the temperature, or basically the threshold for what people will pay, is like evenly dispersed across the craft show. So if you have hobby crafters there that have things that are really cheap, then people come to your booth and they're like, you're charging $25 for this? Why? And it's just like, <laughs> sir, what? <laughs> that's that's the price. And you don't go to Publix and you're like, you're charging $7 for this organic milk. You just put the milk in your cart and you go. So it's, you know, that's a fair point. And, and people do need to be taught. I feel like it's getting better because um, handmade is more prevalent. Um, than it was when we got started several years ago, like in 2008 and and before. But there's still a lot of people that don't respect the value of handmade, which is really annoying because there's a lot of really great handmade artists out there that are making wonderful things that can't sustain their businesses because the pricing thing is, is such a big deal. Well, I mean, that's an education for the makers as well. Like I'll go to, like I was just at a conference called Craftcation in Southern California. And, you know, one of the classes is how to price because odds are you're pricing too low. (laughs) I think people are also afraid to, um, be paid what their work is worth, you know, because we want to make that sale. And I totally get that because I fall into that same trap also, but we have to remember that our creativity and our time have a worth and, uh, we just need to keep that in mind. Exactly. So at this point, kind of summing that all up, what do you feel like is the biggest lesson that you've learned um, in your journey as being an entrepreneur, a handmade 
artist slash uh, crochet artist? Uh, I would say it's listen to your instincts, like follow your gut. <laughs> As you scale your business, you'll start working with other people and you'll feel like, you know, they're an expert in their realm, whether it's your business partner or your agent or whatever. And you might be in the situations where you're not sure what to do and someone is swaying you one way and your gut is telling you the other, but you might sway with them because you feel like they're the expert, but you have to remember you're the creator of your brand. You ultimately will know what's best for your brand. And I feel like sometimes I didn't follow my gut on certain business decisions. And it's not that I have regret. Like I think everything is a learning experience and I've, I've learned a lot and I keep learning but I do think there are some things that could have been done differently and may have had a different outcome if I had listened to myself. So I think it's just have confidence in yourself because it's your name on that product. It's not anyone else's name. It's all you. <laughs> so make sure that whether there's a success or a failure, like you own it, you feel like that was because of you and it was your decision. I think that you'll feel more confident about where your business is going um, if you can just own 100% of it like on a spiritual level. <laughs> yeah. So I just say that trust your own instinct. Like, you know, more than you think you do. And it's great to build a team around yourself, but it's still, you're the boss. So just always remember that you're the boss. Yes. So I have two questions that I like to end every show with. The first one, I call it the pimp your brilliance action challenge. And that is uh, three pieces of advice or tips that you would offer someone who is interested in getting started selling handmade goods. They're all going to seem really generic, I think, but I'll give it a go. Uh, be unique. Be a trendsetter. Don't be a trend follower. That's great for your branding. You'll stand out. People want to know where to go for a product, and they'll think of your brand. Um, number two, you don't have to buy expensive equipment, but shoot the best photos that you can. It kills me when people have great product, but really blurry or poorly lit photos. It matters. It matters for when you're trying to sit, like sell a product. So learn a little bit about lighting. Make sure your photos are in focus. Um, make your product look the best that it can because there's like two seconds, you know, where people are looking at your item thinking about buying it and you want it to look amazing because I'm sure your work is amazing and you want your photos to reflect that. Um, and number three... This is going to sound kind of silly, but I think it's be nice. You know, be nice to your customers. Be nice to your community. Um, that posse I was talking about building, like be nice. I think that um, that will take you very far also. Just uh, be a nice, a nice crafter. Be a fair player. People like that. <laughs> People will like your brand. Yeah. That's very true. So my final question, do you read? Are you a reader? Do you mean like novels? Oh, yeah, just period. I always like to ask people what um, what's something that they've read recently that's blown their mind or a book that they really recommend that other people read. So I, I, I did used to work in publishing. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I totally thought when I left publishing, I would have more time to read actual books because when you're working in publishing, you're reading manuscripts all the time. So you don't really have time to read what we would call real books. Okay, but... Okay, so crocheting is so time consuming. If I have spare time, I'm crocheting. I'm not reading. The only time I read, and this sounds so silly, is at the hair salon. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just sitting there under the heater, and I don't like to bring my crocheting where all that hair dye is. And um, So it's really rare that I get to read, actually. Um, so if I do read, it might be books by people that I know. So a gal who I used to work with at the literary, literary agency her name is Jandy Nelson, um, is starting a really like amazing career as a young adult author. And her, the last book that she wrote was called I'll Give You the Sun. And it's just this beautiful story about twins and a thing that happens in their family. And the writing is gorgeous. And she sold the movie rights. So I hope that actually gets greenlit. So um, if I have a chance to read a book, I definitely love to support the people that I know. Awesome. Well, you know what? And that's that's funny that you say that because I interviewed somebody. Uh, my very first interview was with um, Amber of Damask Love, and she's a, a DIY 
craft a blogger. And she kind of said the same thing. She was like, I don't really have time to read. So um, I know it's the worst. <laughs> it's terrible. You know, we all try to do what we can do, but I love that you still had a suggestion. So I'll make sure I add that to the show notes so that people can check out that book. And Yay. if people want to get in contact with you, where can they find you online? How can they reach out? I'm pretty much Twinkie Chan on all my social media. So that's Facebook, it's Twinkie Chan, Twitter is Twinkie Chan, Instagram is Twinkie Chan. If you want to check out my YouTube channel, it's actually Twinkie Chan TV. Um, and yeah, those are the main ones. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Well, it was so great speaking with you. I love all of the insights that you shared. So thank you so much again for agreeing to come on the show. Oh, thank you so much. It was fun. And that's it for this week's episode. Thanks so much for listening. Learn more about this show and get access to show notes by visiting keepchasingthestars.com. While you're there, make sure you subscribe for updates. I'll be back next week. And in the meantime, go out there and pimp your brilliance.